Welcome to another episode of This Catholic Life, conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we deal with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical, and joyful. Today's show is Hometown Rivalry, a conversation about those rivalries which we think exist or perhaps do exist between various hometowns. I'm your host, Peter Holmes, and today I'm joined by somebody, quite appropriately, from the other side of the continent. Tom Goulet, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Peter. It's good to be back. Indeed. Now, I've had some relatives live in Perth, and I've actually my father visited Perth at one stage, and he reported back, and they said that uh, people in Perth felt as if there was a rivalry with the East Coast, a kind of a, a, a tension between, oh, you, we don't trust those guys over there. Is that true? Oh, look, I suppose that there's probably elements of truth there. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of West Australians will harken back to referendums that were that were held in, in, in the past, uh, where where it was put to the great the people of the great state of Western Australia, uh, should should we should we continue being part of this Commonwealth? And uh, I do believe that it's come rather close, or even actually, <laughs> I, I believe it's actually maybe even maybe even passed the popular vote at various various times. And uh, yeah, West Australians West Australians are very very conscious of the. Uh, the the mining industry here and how it props up the east coast oh. so you know <laughs> <laughs> you think you're paying the bills <laughs> <laughs> i've heard a story about quebec in canada about how they've had several uh, referendums to decide whether or not they're going to leave the rest of canada and mm -hmm. um the the standing joke in the rest of canada is why don't they ha give us the referendum and we will see <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, there's um there is I oh, look. Let's be honest. There's there's a friendly rivalry um across any kind of two towns. Um, what yes, intrigues yeah. me is that I've lived in Adelaide, Melbourne, uh, Sydney. I visited Perth. Uh, sorry, I visited um, Brisbane uh, frequently. In fact, um before COVID, and um I haven't been any f further west than um South Australia. But what I noticed is that the South Australians believed there was a, a rivalry between Adelaide and Melbourne. They, they were very, very passionate about this rivalry, and most Melbourneites just don't care. They go, what? Hang on. Yeah. Whereas um, when I was in Melbourne, they thought there was a massive rivalry between Melbourne and Sydney, and Sydney people in general don't think there's anywhere outside of Sydney. That's um, I've noticed that, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, th th there was a prime minister in Australia who joked that if you're not living in Sydney, you're camping out. <laughs> it's a typical Paul Keating kind of uh, slap down. I have to say that, that that is the attitude I've come across a fair bit in Sydney. Now, I'm not from Sydney, but I've lived here for 20 years, so I've got a little bit of a foot in both camps. But do you, there are some good and bad things about uh, local rivalry. So let's let's list off a few. From your perspective, having lived in Perth but visited the East Coast, what are some advantages to being proud of your own town? I, I think there is something about uh, love of one's kind of homeland and one's, one's people, and that's uh, that's not a kind of blood and soil type uh, argument or anything like that. But I think I think there's, there's a certain nostalgia to the to the place where you grew up um, and the people that that surrounded you and that, and I think that's that's good because that's where we. I mean, ultimately, that's where we kind of learn to love and to learn to be like human. And I think, I think that 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 can't happen in the abstract. So I think that kind of localism is uh, what undergirds that that kind of love of place. And I yeah. think, obviously, that that can that can that can that can go off in all sorts of directions. That, that well, it can... comes back to gratitude, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. It comes back to gratitude because the opposite of being proud of where you come from is to be ashamed of it or to to be ungrateful or perhaps resentful of it. So having some kind of genuine love and uh, respect and, and a little bit of pride in, in the area you grew up in and the, the people that are there and their habits and their quirky little places and things mm. is kind of a, a, a form of gratitude. I think so. I think so. Yeah. And I think... Um... Uh, I remember reading a couple of years ago uh, uh, an author whom, whom I dearly love, who's from from Kentucky. He's a farmer in Kentucky. He writes novels and poetry and, and essays. And right. uh, Wendell Berry is his name. Uh, Wendell Berry, and he wrote. A, he was interviewed in I think the New York Times or the New Yorker or something like that. And uh, part of the, the he's, he's quite a localist. Part of the discussion that he he got into was um, around around localism and uh, well, it was. 
between parochialism, uh, this love of place, and provincialism. And he was making it, drawing a distinction, and he was very saying good. That Let's define those terms, shall we? So, what did he mean by parochialism and provincialism? Well, par- parochialism, he, he thought, was like a, a love of place and a, and a certain pride in being being from that place, and uh, and provincialism was a kind of. Uh, nervousness that someone would find out that I'm from this this backwater somewhere. <laughs> and he tells he tells a story of a conversation that he was in with a uh, with another author who was saying you know, it's the difference is is this, you know, a, a man from from Cork uh, was telling his his two sons as they were leaving leaving home to go out and see the world. He said, My boys, never ask a man where he comes from. If, if he's from Cork, you'll you'll know him. If he's not, you'll embarrass him. And that's the kind of healthy, healthy parochialism that that, uh, that I think uh, he was getting at there. Well, I mean, in in some respects, I remember all the places I've lived. I remember some some things fondly about them, and I'm very grateful for that for that experience. Uh, you know, I I loved the cricket teams I played with in Adelaide, and I loved the food and drink there, and um, especially the wineries which was very much part of my experience there. It certainly not doesn't describe the whole experience, but I have over time come to remember the really good things from there and, and perhaps I've forgotten most of the boredom and the and other things. Melbourne is a similar thing. I remember the sports and the clubs and the and the comedy and the the shows and things very well, but I've forgotten every time I go down there I realize I've completely forgotten what the weather's like. <laughs> and I don't I don't pack appropriately. But there's a kind of a nostalgia for it, and I find myself leaping to its defence when uh, when people have a go at it. Same with Adelaide mm. and Sydney, in spite of its um, complete mayhem and general general bad organisation. I should be careful here. Uh, when friends <laughs> ask me about to describe Sydney in a few sentences, I usually say everything God has done in Sydney is amazing. Everything man has done in Sydney is disorganised. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> so it's a beautiful place, but it's um it's poorly managed. That that's very very bad sweeping generalization, but that seems to be in comparison, at least with other places I've been. Mm. But it, it's interesting that this this idea of rivalry can in fact have um, not only the positive of being grateful from where I'm from, but there is a positive function, and I've noticed that because you and I are on on the opposite sides of the continent in two different campuses mm. of the same university, the University of Notre Dame. And there has been, of course, some, we'll get to the negatives in a little bit, but the the tension between isn't always a bad thing. When you can compare yourself to a, a place that is similar to you, but a little bit different, it helps you look at yourself mm. a little bit critically. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I certainly, um, I mean, in the context of, of university life, I was certainly just seeing how different processes operate, and often those processes gener- uh, are generated from local circumstances. Maybe it's the, the layout of the campus, for example, or yep. just access to different things. Uh, and sometimes those things can be imported into another place. And sometimes when they when we try to import them, it just is an art of failure. Yes. But those, those those provide opportunities to actually look at. You know how we do things here, and is this the best way? Because this is the yes. way it's always been done, and uh, and so there is there is a real opportunity for for growth. Like that kind of diversity yes. um, is is it makes it makes it much stronger. I think. What's intriguing to me about the whole Notre Dame thing is that we re- we pride ourselves in being a small university and a, and a very family oriented kind. Like it's a family feel to it often, with all the good and bad things of, that come with being a family because it's very close, but what you find is when you try and transpose a process, which is very, you know, it's very um, organised and very formal, but when you try and transpose it, you realise how much of it was very much geared to the personalities, the circumstances, the geography, um, you know, the demographics of the area, and it has to be reassessed, which I think is a healthy way of um, looking at things. Mm-hmm. And I think I think uh one of the things that that uh, in this kind of like late modernity where where we find ourselves historically, uh, one of the things that I think we we really lack is is real genuine diversity. Like you can be in the suburbs in in Perth, Western Australia, or in Sydney or Melbourne, and they pretty well look the same, particularly if they've been built in the last fifty years or so. Yes, um, and I think that 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 kind of homogenisation of of kind of living circumstances is really to our detriment. We we kind of we miss all sorts of things. Um, you know, I, I know um, for example in 
like the, the suburb where, where I live is, which is a bit further out from the center of the city. There aren't too many trees around, and uh, because all the houses have been built after uh, after televisions were, were kind of invented, no one no one has a front porch. Whereas <laughs> when I was living a bit closer closer into the city, everyone had a front porch, and everyone spent most of their evenings on the front porch. So I knew my neighbours a lot more, um, uh, for good or ill. But um, but I knew I knew my neighbours a lot more, and uh, I think that there are there are little things like that where uh, we kind of in this kind of homogenizing process of kind of making everything look and feel the same, um, which is useful for kind of bureaucratic purposes and making things kind of function, uh, we can miss the, the kind of the diversity that actually really gives flavour to, to life. So I agree, but there's still there's still some things different. I don't know Perth well enough to, to guess this, but I know in Adelaide some of the things that were very different um, – just small practical things. They used evaporative coolers uh, a lot instead of air conditioning, and evaporative coolers only work in a very dry heat. Yeah, right, and yeah. so you would often have whatever house you're in would be open at the at the ground level. It would like the doors would be wide open, and the evaporate to, to, in order to make the evaporative cooler work, because the evaporation comes down through the house. Whereas in in mm. Sydney, it's such a, a, a you know high humidity that those coolers simply don't work. And so everything's closed for air conditioning and now it works just as effectively, but I really missed mm. the kind of flowing, open uh, experience of Adelaide when I first came across. And, yeah. and it's a very small thing, but it has a profound effect on the feel of the house. Like you have to close yourself in in Sydney to be out of the heat. Sure. In yeah. Melbourne, the weather basically requires you to live differently because it's so unpredictable. You can't plan an outdoor event. And one of the things I noticed in Sydney, there's a huge amount of people saying, let's have a picnic, let's do this, let's go out to there, let's go to the beach. And in Melbourne, you just couldn't um, plan that on a regular basis. So a lot of their stuff is indoors. Yeah, look, I, I've, I mean, I've certainly noticed that in, in Western Australia, we do a lot of things out, out and about. Um, but during winter, now that I have small children, realizing that actually, you know, that's going to be a, an issue for us. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> uh, so, so yeah, there is a bit of a lack of kind of indoor activities for once. But anyhow, yeah, yeah, and even though lots of things are the same, I, I have a Polish colleague at the university, and he comments that Australians don't build houses to hold in or out heat in the same way that Europe does because we simply mm. don't have the same extremes of cold as as they do. Um, yeah, which is an interesting thing, and that has its own cultural, uh, can, you know, sort of implications because we're not we're not terribly good at building houses which are um, insulated in in the sort of way that Europeans are. Let's come back to parochial ideas, though. Mm -hmm. The whole um, sports thing ha happens a bit here in Sydney, less so. Melbourne was just sports mad. I don't know what Perth's like, but Melbourne was sports mad. They would turn up to watch anything. Uh, I remember <laughs> when. NRL first went down to Melbourne, the Melbourne Storm, people were showing up to watch it and they still didn't understand the rules, you know, halfway through the first season. They're just ah. turning up because it's sport. 80-something thousand people turned up to watch Cameroon play Chile in the Olympic game, one of the games for the Olympics, the Sydney Olympics, that was played down in Melbourne. Wow. It was just – and it was sleet. There was actual sleet, Tom. We were sitting in the, in the, in the seat. <laughs> and when I say we, I was one of the 80-something thousand people. Yeah, there you were. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you just turned up because it was sport and we all decided who we were barracking for when we got there. Like it was a very, very <laughs> Melbourne thing to do. Whereas in Sydney, you know, I was stunned when I first came here because I said things like, so which team do you go for? And they go, I don't really follow sport. And I said, uh, I don't understand. Hang on, which team do you go for again? Because um, in <laughs> Melbourne, you just had to have a team. It was just the way it worked. Yep, yep. And people in Sydney just don't seem to care. Yeah, look, I, I'm one of the, the few people in Perth that doesn't seem to care either, actually. But <laughs> uh, I know here, working here in Fremantle, there is, um, you know, it's 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 one of those kind of questions that, that comes out very, very tentatively after you've you've known someone for a little while. So a Dockers guy or an Eagles guy? Um, <laughs> to which I kind of, I, I, at that point, I tend to try and the conversation. But um, that's when you really know who your friends are, I suppose. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I've been a, a Tigers supporter, which is a Melbourne team from 10 years old. And so living in Sydney as a Tigers supporter, I expected the Sydney people to not like me because of that. But to be honest, they could not care less. 
Yeah. <laughs> just yep. <laughs> whereas when I was in Adelaide, um, my car was spat on and hit while I when I when it was parked and I was somewhere else because I had Victorian plates on. So it was. <laughs> Gee, that's pretty full on. It was pretty wow. full on. So there, there is a an unhealthy rivalry in some respects, and we've seen some of this coming up in some of the press conferences that we're unfortunate enough to have every day these days. Yeah. And when politicians use uh, what might be a healthy and friendly rivalry as a kind of a way of dividing and, and furthering or distracting perhaps from their own problems, would you say that's an accurate thing or am I just exaggerating? Yeah, no, I think, I think, I think um, anything, anything good. And I think there is, there is some goodness to, to that kind of love of, of your, of the, your place and your people. Anything good is easily perverted and often, and often is and I think in that in this context we certainly see it and, and uh, uh, there is yeah uh, particularly in, in the kind of context that we find ourselves in here in 2021 with uh, with all the the various kind of issues around the, the global pandemic we see we see these things coming out and uh, being used as real dividers uh, and and uh, and I think the, um, the the thing about about this kind of this these local kind of things you know we can only hold the rivalry because we're actually really very similar um, right yeah. if we we're if we we're poles apart uh culturally you wouldn't say half the things that you say because it would be very easily branded as xenophobic or racist or and probably would end up being exactly that and i think the the kind of friendly rivalries that we we tend to enjoy um uh can only really occur because of the, the very deep similarity that we have um, that's true but, we're in a we're in a we're in a unique spot, I think, historic, historically and culturally right now, because those friendly rivalries uh, seem to be in certain circles becoming less friendly. Less friendly. You're probably right about that, and that might be a little bit of a to the tension that we're all feeling about COVID coming into it. But some of my mm. friends in in Queensland and Victoria and and South Australia have been. Uh, having a go at me about our premier as if I had some sort of direct input into their decisions um, <laughs> or, or take some personal <laughs> responsibility for the way it works out here in Sydney. But there is a resentment of something is ruining our way of life and um, getting in the way of what I want to do. And you guys seem to be to blame for it. So I'll throw it your way. It's not a healthy way of doing it. Mm. I would mm. I would say that uh, if our parochialism expresses itself in terms of gentle ribbing but a genuine desire to share what we have that's mm. good here with our friends, then that would work out fine. So if you come over to Sydney, I, I wouldn't spend my time ragging Perth, but what I might do is want to show you the great places in Sydney that I'd like to show off. Sure. I, th I think that's the... Uh... The idea of kind of love of love of neighbour that that actually um, you know there's there's love of neighbour as in the person right next door to me, um, which actually uh, in the very Chestertonian sense is uh, is you know often the hardest thing. Yeah, um, love love of enemy and love of neighbour are often uh, mentioned by yep. our Lord because they're often the same person. Uh, <laughs> Interesting fact um, that in I, Hebrew, um, the the name the word for neighbour and the word for enemy are only distinguished by the tiniest uh, dot. Well, there you go. That's um, that's, that's interesting to know, actually. Um, <laughs> but I, but I think you know, love of neighbours in like from a neighbouring city or village or town, or state, that that can really be shown in in welcoming people into your experience of of the world and and how that's kind of played out in the very concrete facts of life. So it might be the beautiful lake that's that's kind of a river that's not too far from your home or uh, some of the other beautiful sites or the people that you know in that space. And I think uh, sharing that is, is part of the, 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 the joy of, um, mm. of, of or sharing the, the joy and, and the pride of, or that you have in your, in your home, homeland, hometown. I have to say, though, that some of them are a little dubious. So, for example, when I was in Adelaide, some dear friends absolutely had to take me to go and get a pie floater. I don't know if you know what a pie floater is, but it's – Basically, a, it's a. They only sell them on the streets of Adelaide, like off these pie carts that sort of sit there. Like right. in Sydney, it would be a kebab cart or something like yeah, that. Yeah, sure. But, and I've noticed more. And maybe it's the area of Sydney I'm in, but I, I, the kebab carts are amazing, and you get kebabs. So hooray! But in Sid, in Adelaide, back when I was there, they had these pie carts. And they were like a, a caravan with sides opened, you know, like an ice cream stand, but it had. Yeah. 
pie floaters and you you couldn't it wasn't takeaway you had to eat it on the kind of the the, the shelf that was outside right there, on the, side of the cart because they would put a bowl in front of you they'd put a meat pie in the middle of the bowl and they would pour green pea soup thick green pea soup over the whole thing and then you would put sauce on top of the whole thing it was the most bizarre experience i've had but they <laughs> they insisted that i only tried it after i'd had a guinness and it, it after a guinness it tasted good, but I, I suspect that after a Guinness, anything would taste good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was it, it. Was an interesting experience, and we did it because because it was the local thing to do. Um, in Sydney, I, I yep. would be hard pressed to to point to a particular food that was different from here. Would you say that there's a local yeah. one from over there? Oh, look, I think I think I don't, I'm not sure if it's uh, if it's been exported elsewhere, but the uh, the continental roll here in Western Australia is. Uh, is the kind of local favourite, which is basically a selection of, of deli meats and pickled vegetables and the whole bit, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's wow. the best. Mm. Oh well, I've never heard come of over, it. So... Come over this, come over yeah, this, come over this way, Peter. I'll treat you. Well, as soon as they release us from COVID, I will take you up on that, Tom. <laughs> I'll bring my yeah. wife with me. We'll make a date of it. Being released is one thing, but being wet into Western Australia is a whole other. That is so... true. That is true. So. We've probably come to the point where we say now that rivalry is a good thing, provided it's done with love that it, it can actually keep us a little bit honest about our own self-acknowledgement and self-assessment, and uh, it can ho- perhaps open us up to experiences outside of our world because sometimes parochialism mm. can lead us to be too insular and therefore mm. not understand the world. Yeah. I actually think one of the other dangers in, in our kind of very kind of like late modern culture is uh, is not having a place, like not actually being tied to a place. Very good. Um, and I think about this. I think about this in like parish life, for example. Um, a lot of young. I work with with young adults here in, in chaplaincy, and a lot of young adults. And and you know, everyone's mobile. Everyone's got a car. Um, you kind of go to mass, for example, with your friends, or where the, where your friends are, and they might not be your local parish. By the time people are getting a little bit older and getting married and having kids, if they've not found a, a parish home there, there can be in a, a bit of strife i think because we miss the kind of concrete instantiation of the people of god where we're actually meant to learn to love uh, our neighbor um, yeah. and i think it robs us the, of some of the incarnational aspect of our faith most certainly and i think that's something that that uh you know I, i'm certainly pray to as well you know uh, when my wife and i got married we kind of moved uh, suburbs so we weren't really tied to the the, the very particular place where we were, um, and it took. It's taken us a while to really find a find a home because you know you're nowhere's perfect, and so yes. you know you you've, at some point you've actually got to just own that and say, well, how can I try and make this a little bit more perfect or yeah. a little bit better than what it is, or actually throw my lot in with, with these people? Isn't um, that that's interesting because uh, that's that's the parochialism. Uh, how parochialism becomes better when people are proud enough of their local area that they don't just excuse its faults, but they work hard to make it a more awesome place. Most certainly, and I think I think that's the, you know, I think in our in our kind of very modern culture with so much uh, so much choice, uh, we can actually miss out on on like actually being present to where we are. A good way to wrap this episode up is um, to recommend to the listener that you seek out and read an essay by G.K. Chesterton on cheese. He, on cheese? Yes, he wrote, he wrote a very short piece. It's only a page and a half or maybe two pages on cheese, and it's about this very thing. He talks about having a yes. journey across England where uh, every time they stopped in a local area, they had their local cheese, uh, and he railed yeah. against the idea of having cheddar everywhere. And he used it as Praise a the Lord. he used it as an example. It's just typical Chestertonian thing that he he took cheese and made it into a, a an example of distributism and localism versus communism. And it was brilliantly Beautiful. put that we we value the fact that this cheese is only available here, and this this experience of life, this incarnational experience, is only available in this time and place with these people and that we should treasure that and we should celebrate it and where it doesn't interfere with genuine care of neighbor and it's not isolationism for the sake of it we should celebrate it and praise god for it most certainly all right it's probably a good place to wrap this particular discussion up if you today's discussion got you thinking or arguing or you think we we're unfair or perhaps too fair to some places Hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook or Discord. Tell us your favourite local custom that's a little bit strange. 
Uh, write us a review on iTunes. This is a particularly Australian Catholic podcast, and we think that's a good idea. We'll be back next week, but that's all for now. Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life. Mm-hmm.